I'm not sure what it is. Maybe I've just I've been thinking about it differently, or there's different aspects of it that I've been thinking about. Um, what's that? Grandchild. Grandchild might be part of it, but I, that I think it's a whole composite of things that that um, are is making it happen. Um, but it's interesting that when you think about one of the most amazing facts ever, and this is kind of really what stirred up for me, is that the whole world marks time according to Christmas. The whole world marks time according to Christmas. You ever stop to think about that? The whole world, not just Christendom, the whole world. And, and the funny part is most of them don't even understand it because we have this, this division in time and we had the, the time period before Christ and now we have the time period after his birth. And you think about it, every time that somebody writes down a date, when, when they put 2022, 2023, 1920, doesn't matter. They're actually saying that there's been this many years since Jesus was born. Yeah. All over the world. All over the world. And think about history books. When they write history, they write on this day in 2022, this happened. And so you look back and you say, at this time, at this point, in this juncture, it was so many years after Jesus was born. See, most of them, I mean, if, if, if you mention it to them, they'd probably say, oh, yeah, yeah, now that you mention it, I, yeah, that makes sense, I guess. But most people just go around and don't realize the date proclaims Jesus' birth. Isn't that amazing? It's just like, wow. You know, just everything that... that um, so we have the, the B.C. in time, before Christ, and then we have A.D., and a lot of people think that means after his death, but if that was the case, then it would be 33-year gap. And, of course, the A.D. stands for, it's a Latin word, it's adio domini, and what it actually means is the year of our Lord. So when it's 2022 A.D., is 2022 the year of our Lord. We should put that on there. We should make people, when they date stuff, write that behind it. Wouldn't that be cool? Uh huh? All over the world, people are writing the year of our Lord. Uh huh? So that's been amazing. I've been just pondering on that is, is how much of, see, this is another one of those things that it seems like God has been showing me. This is another tangible thing that we can, we can, see and know and understand just in our everyday generic world every time a date is seen or written it seems hot Tim yeah he's fixing it that's what happens when we have guest speakers and the, the, the game gets changed for folks and so it's got to come back um, every time that a date is written we're proclaiming the year of the Lord I love it the heathens are out there proclaiming the year of the Lord, and they don't even know it. God's tricking them. Hallelujah. Um, I just find that amazing that when we know that 2,023 years ago, Jesus was born. And that's, what, that's the time period we're celebrating right now is his birth, Christmas, the birth of Christ. And, and you say, well, when was he born? Well, it was 2,023 years ago. Well, how do you know that? Because time switched at that point. Um, and that's what I think one of the things that, that makes Christmas so amazing is, you know, is it, is it family get-togethers? Is it, um, you know, the giving and getting of gifts? Is it the good buys in the stores? Is it the good food? Good food is a good thing. Um, paid time off. Are you, have you got the gain almost all the way down? If you turn the gain down and the slider's up sometimes that, generally I think the gain is all the way off on, on this mic. And then you just have to bring the volume up through the sliders. So that sounds better. Um, so is it, is it paid time off? I, I, I like paid time off. 
after being self-employed for 20 years, paid time off is kind of this magical thing that I have come to know. Um, so, you know, what is it that makes Christmas so amazing? And we're going to look, we're going to take a look at the Christmas story and find out what makes Christmas so amazing. I think we'll look at some things maybe we haven't seen. So we're going to go to Matthew. We're going to read uh, 1, 18 through 23. It says, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. Think about that. The, 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 the Matthew's writing is saying, hey, this is how it happened. This is a historical event. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed or engaged to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, if, if you've read that little book um, by uh, Zola Levitt, it talks about how a, a Jewish man would go to get a bride. And he would go and he would, would offer her the offer to basically say, hey, this is what I have to offer you. Uh, he would drink his half of the cup. If she agreed to the marriage, she would drink her half of the cup. And then he would actually leave and go prepare a place for her. And he could be gone three months to a year while he's preparing the place and then to come back and get his bride. Well, this is telling us of that time period. Joseph had come to Mary and they were betrothed, they were engaged, and he was gone, and now all of a sudden, she's with child. Well, even in today's age, the, the neighbors might talk. The people at work might talk, all right? So it says that when, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. See, now, of course, the neighbors and the people at work probably wouldn't comprehend how she became with child. But Matthew tells us, and the other writers tell us, how she conceived this child. It was conceived of the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just and unwilling uh, to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. And, of course, he would have had the right to do such. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So he knew that God was doing something. God came to him and said, hey, don't be afraid to, put her, or don't be afraid to take her as your wife. I'm working this thing out. The Holy Spirit is the, is the one that she's conceived by. Um, she will bear a son. So right away he knows he's having a son and not a daughter. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And, and so think about what must have been like for Joseph when he heard the word that this child in Mary was the one that was going to save the people from their sins. Think they've been, they've been waiting since the Garden of Eden for this seed that was promised. We talked about the covenants that God made. Here now was God's faithfulness showing up all these years later in Mary. The seed was there. And of course, Jesus, he said, his name shall be called Jesus. In, in Hebrew, it's Yeshua. And, and the name would be God is salvation. So when he spoke the name, he was saying, listen, this is God and he's bringing salvation. I mean, this is no small proclamation. This is, this is something that they would have just stopped them in their tracks to think about. Um, and then think about, it talked about in verse 23, how the virgin, Emmanuel, God with us. That's the fulfillment of that prophecy. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is God with us. 
See, and this is the scripture that I go to when the Jehovah's Witnesses come to my house and they want to share their uh, beliefs with me. And so I grab their Bible, their New World Translation, which usually freaks them out. And I go to this prophecy, and in there it says this exact scripture. Because, Jeho because Charles Taze Russell wasn't really all that smart to be able to wash out all that God had done. And then I go to Matthew, and I show them that here is the fulfillment of the prophecy that your Bible prophesied of. And isn't it funny that it says that it's God with us? This is God being born. I said, you know, this is what your Bible says, that, that Jesus was God. He wasn't something God created. He's God. And we need to know that, too. That's one of the amazing things about Christmas is, is that God became a human. El Shaddai, Jehovah, the, the Almighty, became human. God became human. That's God, the creator of everything, created humanity, and then he became one. Isn't that amazing? That's why Christmas changes everything. It does. It changes everything because God put on human form in that little manger. He became a human. God became a human. Um, just think, while the world is counted down to Christ through all of the, the old covenant and, and the, the period before his birth, all of the people groups, the time was counting down to Christ. So you have 1 B.C., 2 B.C., 3 B.C., going back to the garden. But now we, we count back to Christ. It's been 2,023 years since the birth of the Christ child. See, they were looking forward to it. We look back to it. You know, and if you think about when the angel showed up to Joseph and to Mary, they had been looking for this. They'd been waiting for his Jews, all the sacrifices and everything they had done and the types and shadows were looking for this time period Amazingly, we look back to this time period when everything changed and God became human. But you know what's interesting about that period is the attack on the deity of Christ. See, that's one of the things that the world really attacks is the deity of Jesus Christ. Because, see, if they can take away his deity... See, then it changes everything. It just does. Because he's no longer God in human form. He's just a human. Okay? And, um, and so it's interesting when you, we, we look and Jesus even asked the question. Um, let me see. Where did I get lost? Oh, I got ahead of myself here. So let's go to Isaiah 7:14. This is this is the the prophecy that was given. It says, "Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Listen carefully. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel, God with us." I mean, it it's the same as in Matthew. It's the fulfillment of this scripture. Um that God became a human. It's, it's just, so then, then we look at how, you know, we see scripture tells us that God became a human. And we just mentioned how the deity of Jesus Christ is attacked. And, and so, Jesus himself spoke about it. Who do men say that I am? Jesus himself spoke of it. They say, um, a lot of times people say, well, Jesus was a, a good man. He was one of the prophets. Uh, he's like one of the other prophets of the other religions. And to that, we have an, a, a resounding no, he's not. 
He's God incarnate. He's, he's El Shaddai with us. And Jesus was and is and always will be God. He was. And so even, I, I was talking about even Jesus brought up these questions in, in Matthew 16, 13 through 16. Now when Jesus came into the, dis, the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? So here we see the Son of Man. This is, this is Jesus proclaiming his human side. And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So Peter declares his divinity. So Jesus asked the question to them, who, who, does, who do people say that I am? And it's interesting because even today the question is asked. It's really one of the things that, that we as Christians have to be able to answer is who is Jesus? Because if we say that he's one of the prophets or he's a good man or you know he's someone that came and, and lived a good life, um, that doesn't declare his divinity. It declares his humanity but it doesn't declare his divinity, and, and it's essential why we are able to declare his divinity. See, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He wasn't conceived by, by man's seed. He was conceived by the seed of the Holy Spirit. And that's what makes him the divine side. You know, and, and you think about, we think about, we talk about the Immaculate Conception, okay? And sometimes we don't understand that that's a word that we actually use more often than we think, Immaculate. See, I could say that my wife keeps our house Immaculate. She keeps it clean. She keeps it pure. She keeps it without spot, is what it refers to. And so when, when Jesus was conceived, when Mary was conceived with Jesus, the conception was immaculate, it was without spot. It was pure. It wasn't tainted as if, the, if, if Joseph would have been the seed. Um, Matthew 1.18 talks about, you know, we go back to Matthew 1.18, it talks about with child of the Holy Spirit. Verse 20 talks about conceived in her of the Holy Spirit. So the egg was of the woman, but the seed was of the Holy Spirit. And the reason that it, it, God did it that way is because 10 times in the Old Testament, it talks about or it speaks of the um, iniquities of the fathers. But it never talks about the iniquity of the mothers. Now you ladies can can probably take that scripture and, and use it against us. All the trouble comes from us guys, and in this situation, that's probably true. Um, but it's essential that we know that, that this seed that was planted in Mary at this Immaculate Conception was, was passed on by the Holy Spirit and not the Father. And that's what made Jesus different than every other human being born on the planet because of the Immaculate Conception. And um, so, born of a woman and not of a man. The seed come from the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, the interesting side is, is why would God do that? So that Jesus could be fully human and fully God. That's, that is the, the basis of our belief, that Jesus is fully human and also fully God. In, in Philippians, it talks about how he laid down his divinity. He had it. When he was born, he had it, but he laid it down and walked as a man. He had to trust and walk by faith and believe in his Father to do the work that he needed done, just like you and I do. Because, see, if, if he walked as God and, and, and was able to walk without sin as God, then we don't have a chance. 
but because he was human and he walked and he fulfilled all that God required as a human, see, then he represents us. And that was the key behind him being fully God and fully man is that he, as a man, could represent us. And that's what we needed was representation. And so we see the divinity and the humanity of Christ. God became a human. God became a man. It's still, if, if you know, what happens is, is when I think about that, I think of God and, and just the infinite nature of God being poured into a finite situation, into a finite being. It's just almost more than you can comprehend if you really think about it, that all that God is poured into Mary. But also, when we get born again, guess what happens? All that God is gets poured into us. Scripture tells us that the fullness of the Godhead dwells in us bodily. That's another one of those. But if Scripture says it, it is. That's an amazing fact. It really is. So there's no other religion that can claim their founder is God. Not one. It can be Buddha. It can be Muhammad. It can be whoever. You know, I've talked to some of these people, and I said, are you really going to rest your eternal life on Joseph Smith, Charles Taze Russell, Buddha, whatever the God might be that you think is going to give you eternal life. I said, the, the sad part is that all of those representations are dead. Our God is alive. Our Savior rose again. Amen. And anybody that rises from the dead, I'm going to listen to. Amen. I just, just believe that. So Jesus became a man, which is no small point, and Jesus was born of an incorruptible seed. You know, it's interesting because last Sunday we talked about that communion, about how you and I have been born again of an incorruptible seed. Where did the incorruptible seed come from? It's from our Savior. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 2, 3, 1, 23. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. And because he came as a human, we see that that incorruptible seed led to us as a born-again believer having that incorruptible seed in us. You know, it ties right into him bringing us to the end, blameless and without spot. Well, why is that? Because the seed that's been planted in us is incorruptible. You and I cannot corrupt that seed. And I'm thankful because I'm sure I could do it, not even trying, because of my humanity side. But I don't walk by sight, I walk by faith. Amen. I'm a God man, I'm not a man God. Hallelujah. Um, so, Emmanuel, God with us, causes us to focus in on the God side. Emmanuel, you picture that God coming to be with us. And that's pretty amazing. Um, the other thing to think about is think that God didn't send a messenger. He didn't send a representative to deal with humanity's issue. He came himself to redeem us. God came himself to redeem us. Wow. Wow. That, that's how much God loved us, that he was willing to come himself to redeem us. That's awesome. That's just amazing. Um, so think about, you know, if, if some guy gets a speeding ticket and he has a good friend of his that's a judge, and so he calls his friend and he says, hey, uh, I got a speeding ticket. Uh, here's the case of it. Uh, can you help me out with that? And the judge says, yep, I'll help you out with that. So... A couple weeks later, the gentleman sees the judge, and he goes up to him, and he says, Man, I'm so thankful you were able to dismiss my speeding ticket. And the judge says to him, Well, I didn't dismiss your speeding ticket. I paid it. And the gentleman says, Well, I, I, I didn't want you to pay it. I just wanted to kind of do that judge thing, you know what I mean? You know, just dismiss it. 
He said, well, were you guilty of speeding? He said, well, yeah. He said, because you were guilty, I was not able to dismiss it. As a righteous judge, it, guilt had to be paid for. And I paid your ticket for you. See, that's the same thing that, that happened in the courts of heaven, is that we were all guilty of sin. Sin was iniquity in our lives. And, and we can't ever stop to think that God just dismissed our sin. It had to be paid for. A righteous judge has to receive the payment for the penalty. For the wages of sin is death. And here we see God comes in the form of a human doesn't send a representative, comes himself and dies for you and I. He paid our price. And the amazing part is, is not only did he pay our price and set us free from the penalty of sin, he set us free to go and live any which way we choose. He did not make stipulations that if I pay this, you'll do this. Because, see, he wanted a relationship with mankind that was through the basis of love and desire. He didn't want moist robots that owed him. So whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And, and, and humanity can choose to believe and accept the Savior, or they can choose to not. No, I think it's a foolish choice not to because of the end of the outcome of what it turns to. But the reality is, is that nobody is going to hell because of sin. Sin is dealt with. Unbelief is that which turns you away from God. You refuse to believe that God came as a man, paid your price, and set you free so that you could choose him and have eternal life. Amen? And thankfully... We've made that choice. So the second point to my thing, to, to the amazement of Christmas is, God became human. I understand that sounds a lot like the first point, because the first point was that God became human. But the second point is that God became human. We're going to look at the humanity side of God. How amazing that God was even born. Think about that, that God was born. Well, and then think about the, what it, here's Mary on the back of a donkey going to, the, to for the census. They, they get to, and there's no room. No lavish place to have your baby. There was no, you know, hot tub to soak in while you're in, you know, having contractions. None of that stuff. Luckily, the, the innkeeper put them up in, in the stall where there was a manger. But God became human. Wow. He needed others to care for him. This is the Almighty. This is the Creator. God now is subject and in need of his creation to look after him as a human. But he chose that. And, and sometimes we forget that Jesus probably had dirty diapers. He was a human. It's just like little Flora. She has dirty diapers. She needs somebody to take care of her. And it's just like all of us. We grew up. We had brothers and sisters. Jesus had brothers and sisters. He went to school. He played. He probably skinned his knees and skinned his elbows. Sometimes we don't think about Jesus, God, as a human. God became human. The creator became the creation. He chose that out of love. So, then why did he become human? What was the whole point of it? What was the reason why God had to take on human form? 
And this is where we start to look at the humanity of Christ. We've looked at the deity of Christ, but let's look at the humanity because he was fully God and fully man. Let's look at the fully man part. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is the Word. Scripture in numerous places tells us that Jesus is the Word. The Word is capitalized here. If, especially if we go to uh, John 1.14. And the Word became flesh. The Word became flesh. It put on an earth suit and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. He put on flesh. Let's go to 1 John 4, 2 and 3. By this you know that know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Why is it so important that Jesus became a human? See, if Jesus didn't become a human, then he couldn't have died for our sins. That is the most important part of Jesus, of God becoming human, putting on an earth suit, becoming humanity, was solely so that he could represent us as humans and die for us. Once again, he had to become human to redeem us. He did. And, and so we think about that life. You know, we, we, we celebrate communion because we look at what he did for us. We know that he was crucified, and he died. He was buried, and he rose again. He rose again as a human. So seated at the right hand of God the Father right now is a human. And the reason that's exciting for me is because I know that humanity fits into heaven. Because our, the first fruits went there for us. Now granted, we will be changed. Scripture tells us we will be changed. But that's just our earth suit. Our spirit man is already there. It says we're seated at the right hand of God the Father. Amen. And so Hebrews 2.14 talks about, as a human, he was able to die in our place. There it is. Therefore, since these, his children, share in flesh and blood the physical nature of mankind, he himself, in a similar manner, also shared in the same physical nature, but without sin, so that through an experiencing death he might make powerless, ineffective, impotent, him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. So we see Jesus as a human was able to die in our place, and doing so he broke the power of the devil over the believer's life. See, you and I no longer are under the dictatorship of the devil. And the reason being is because Jesus, as a human, died in our place, then went and, and took away the power that Adam and Eve had given Satan. He took the, the keys to hell, death, and a grave away from Satan and brought that power back and gave it back to us. But it all had to be done as a human. It all had to be done as a human. That's why God became human. He put on an earth suit. Um, and, then, and then Hebrews, if you think about it, goes on and talks about we don't have a high priest that doesn't, isn't able to uh, um, understand us. That he also went to all of these physical things just like we do. So we can't go to our high priest and ever say you don't understand. He understands. Well, why is he able to understand and be the high priest that we need? Because he was human. He was tempted and tested, but without sin. 
We can't go to him and say, hey, you don't realize the pressures that I'm under. Can you imagine the pressures that he was under? When Satan had him up on the high mountain and, and, and trying to get him to, to take, and, and so the second Adam would fall and not be able to re, re, uh, redeem humanity. He knows what we go through. We have no reason not to go to the throne of grace and find the mercy we need in, the time of, in our time of need. We have that kind of a high priest. See, in the old covenant, they had a high priest, but the high priest was, was a man just like they are, and he had sin also. He had to sacrifice an animal for his sins before he could go into the Holy of Holies. We now have a high priest that's seated in the Holy of Holies. The, the veil was torn from top to bottom, and because of the work and the, and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you and I now have full access into the Holy of Holies. God is not outside of reach. And not only that, the God that we have understands us. And the enemy would like to try and get us to think that he doesn't. Well, don't go tell him about that. He won't understand. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. He knows what we go through. Amen? And um, because he was human, he can relate to our situations in life. Um, got a lot of pages today. Still amazing to me, and like I said, this for whatever reason, this Christmas seems like there's just more amazement to me, is that God became a human. That is just almost more than you can comprehend, because uh, you know when when you picture God, He's He's the universe. He's He's all in all. He's He's eternal. And you think of all that being wrapped up in a baby. Wow. So, let's look at Isaiah 9, 6. And I think we're going to see two truths about Christ here that maybe we haven't seen before when we read the Scripture. And I'm just going to read the first verse of it. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. And here we see both the humanity of Jesus, a son is born, and we see the deity of Jesus, a son is given. The son of God is given. How amazing that this prophecy fulfilled in Christ, both the human side and the deity side, and not only that, but that God came because of his great love for us to redeem us, to buy us back, so that he could have that relationship, that one-on-one -on -one relationship with you and I that he always desired. It isn't about religion. It isn't about big buildings filled with people. It's about the intimate, personal relationship that you and I have with our Savior. See, even as a husband and wife, my relationship is not co-bound to Jesus or to Verna's relationship with Jesus. We both have our individual relationship with Jesus. And they're different. Now, it's the same Savior. And then we have fellowship around our relationship with Jesus, just like you and I as the body of Christ have our own individual relationship with Jesus, but yet we have that koinonia fellowship where the Spirit of God that lives in you and the Spirit of God that lives in me comes together to glorify Him, to praise His name, to encourage each other and build each other up and edify each other to continue to look unto the Savior who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. See, I can't walk out your walk and you can't walk out mine, but I certainly can stand along the way and cheer you on. And that's what the body of Christ is about. But the whole thing is wrapped up in the fact that it's not about our doing, which religion tells us it's about. It's about our believing. Christianity is about our believing, what we believe. See, when you and I believe, that God came as a human, was born on this earth, 
was, was made flesh, then you and I comprehend the fullness of who Jesus Christ is. That he's fully God and fully man. And both were necessary because God came to redeem us. But he redeemed us through the fully human side of him, dying in our place and redeeming us and paying the price and paying the penalty, removing the, the um, power of sin over our lives. You know, Scripture tells us that he took us out of the kingdom of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of light of his dear son. See, you and I at our born-again experience were removed from the darkness, from the sin, from the covering of sin over us, and translated into the kingdom of light. Hallelujah. So now you and I, we're not God, and we'll never become God, but we're, we're God people. God resides in us. See, it, it, it's Jesus became man. He was God. And he became man, and we were man, and we got filled with God. How amazing that the human being is capable to hold God. That God could come and cohabitate in us. Well, the reason being is we're made in his image, we're made in his likeness. It was a perfect fit, because God was in there before. And because of sin, God was removed. But because of our faith and our belief, God then returns back and empowers us to walk out our Christian life. Amen? Amen. So you and I need to, to not walk according. Scripture tells us that if we keep in step with the Spirit, we won't fulfill the desires of the flesh, which tells us that we're fully able. God has equipped us to walk uprightly. I've always said my, my dilemma is, is, is which one am I going to listen to? Because sometimes the flesh has some strong desires. And sometimes I yield to them. As much as I really don't want to, sometimes I do. And that's when I'm able to run to the throne of grace, knowing that it's him that's going to keep us until the day of redemption. It's, it's Jesus' work and his power that's going to, Bring me as the spotless bride. Amen. And this earth suit will be kicked off one day. I tell you, this earth suit's a troublemaker at times. <laughs> Hallelujah. So that's what's so amazing about Christmas for me is that God became human. And that God became human. Amen. Thank you, Father, for such an amazing plan that you put together on our behalf that you would come and be what we had need of redemption that you were able to thwart the plans of the enemy through the body of Jesus Christ and that that body willingly was hung on a cross for our sake and that that human body was broken and scourged and laughed at and mocked and died. And when he died, we died with him. And when he died, the penalty of the law died with him. But thanks be to God, through that time period of his burial, he went and did an amazing work on our behalf. He thwarted the plans of the enemy took away all of his power, all of his ability to harass us without us having any ability or any power or strength to withhold against him. But then he rose again on the third day. And when he rose, we rose again, brand new, never before seen creations in Christ. All that sin was left and died with that old man, and we were raised brand new righteous and holy and sanctified and justified through the work of Jesus Christ. And then he went and he freely gave us back all power and all authority that we, as believers, can take and use to affect our lives and the world of the lives, the lives of the world around us 
to show your glory and your love. And that's what makes Christmas so amazing. So we thank you today as we stop and we pause and remember the Christ child. We also remember what that Christ child grew up to be, our Redeemer, our Savior, our friend, and our Redeemer. Thank you, Jesus, for doing that work on our behalf. We give you praise and glory and honor right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Love you guys. Let's go have some food and fellowship. If we don't see you Wednesday night, maybe we'll see you Saturday night. And if we don't see you either, either of those two nights, have a Merry Christmas. Go and be the blessings that you are. Amen.